The Lord be with you. We welcome uh, members and guests who have joined us as we gather together uh, for worship and receiving his gifts. What a privilege and an honor for us to, to gather under the Lord's name here today. We're going to be looking at the raising of Lazarus. This is a foreshadowing of the resurrection of which we will be celebrating uh, on Easter just in a couple of weeks. Following the late service, there will be a meal that will follow. You're welcome to come back for that meal. Women's Ministry is sponsoring that. And then also a reminder that between the two Lenten services on Wednesday, there will be a spaghetti meal sponsored by the youth and a few other groups that will be helping with that. Next Saturday is our Easter egg hunt at 2 o'clock. Uh, be sure to invite your neighbors and friends. Uh, has gone very well in the past. With God willing, the weather will hold out. For that event. Uh, we have a youth night also tonight for both uh, middle school and high school here at the church. So something also for you to are for people to consider. Uh, and then finally we, we're going to be talking in Bible class today about uh, kind of the creation evolution stuff, how we deal with that in the church as we continue to look at uh, proclaiming the faith uh, in a world in apologetics class in our adult class. So God's richest blessings on your worship. We open with our first hymn. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered this morning to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. 
Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Precious in the sight of the Lord, I love the Lord because he has heard my hurt, my voice and my peace. Because he has inclined his ear to me, the snares of death encompass me, the pangs of Sheol lay hold on me. And then I called on the name of the Lord, for you have delivered my soul from death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Precious in the sight of the Lord. together. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading for this, the fifth Sunday of Lent, comes to us from Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. Uh, this is bringing life from dry bones, uh, another foreshadowing of the resurrection and how God in Christ completely changes us and will eventually change us at the second coming. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh, Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. And then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes to us from the book of Romans, uh, the 8th chapter, 1 through 11. 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. The Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. We rise. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And this will serve as the basis for the message. This is the well-known account of the raising of Lazarus. When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. And so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. And then Jesus de moved again, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave. And a stone lay, lay against it, and Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around. that They may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This time we joyfully confess together our common Christian faith in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, 
begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated, the children, are invited to come forward at this time. Good morning. Thank you. Today, we're going to look at the story found in the gospel message. So, can you see who that is? Who does that look like? Jesus. And the man next to him is telling him some frightening news. Do you remember the story of Mary and Martha? Where Mary sat and listened with Jesus while Martha was busy cleaning the house? Well, they had a brother named Lazarus. And Lazarus was sick. Now, do you know, what do you think Jesus did when he heard that Lazarus was sick? Did he go help him right away? No, he waited. And eventually, Jesus heard even worse news. Lazarus had died. What do you think Jesus did then? Yeah, he went over to visit with Mary and Martha again. And so he told his disciples, come on, let us go. So, who do you think that is? Who's approaching Jesus? Martha, that's right. And she says, Jesus, my brother has died. Do you think Jesus liked hearing that? Did that make him happy? No, it was a sad thing. But he told her, your brother will rise again. Now, do you think Martha knew that Jesus was going to raise her brother right away? No, she knew that one day there would be a resurrection of the dead. But she didn't know what Jesus was talking about fully right now. And so, they approached the tomb. And do you know what Jesus did when he reached the tomb? He cried. The Bible says Jesus wept. He loved Lazarus. He loved Mary and Martha. And so when he saw that Lazarus had died, he wept. But that's not all he did. He prayed to God. He asked God to show his glory. And do you know what the next thing Jesus said was? Lazarus, come out. And so they opened the tomb. And who was there? It was Lazarus. Lazarus had been raised from the dead. And so, do you know what we're celebrating in two weeks? Easter. And so, in Easter we celebrate Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And so this is a foreshadowing of that great Easter morning. Can you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you 
Thank you. You raised Lazarus from the dead. You raised Lazarus from the dead. And you rose from the dead for us. Give us faith. Give us faith. That holds on to the hope of the resurrection. Amen. Thank you so much for your help today. You guys can go back to your seat when we sing the sermon. Amen. In the name of Jesus, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our text is from John 11, uh, that well account, known account of Lazarus. A Sunday school teacher was telling the events of Lazarus' death and Jesus bringing him back to life in her class. And so she asked a young boy, what were the words that Jesus used that brought Lazarus out of the grave? And the little boy responded correctly by saying the words, Lazarus, come out. And she said, you're right. But why do you think he said that? Oh, why did he do that? That's always the challenge, right? So he thought a bit and said, well, if he would have just said, come out, 
we would have had a stampede of dead people getting out of their graves. But by saying only his name, the others stayed put. This little boy certainly had a grasp on the power of Christ's words. The raising of Lazarus is a foreshadowing, as we mentioned before, of Christ's resurrection that we know will occur, or that would occur just a short time later. It is an event that brings forth hope like none other from the one who says he is the resurrection and the life. He uses a lot of I am statements. I am is shorthand for I am Yahweh. And this time, I'm the door, I'm the gate. Here he says, I am the resurrection and the life. So it gives hope. This is also an event which shows us the power of Christ in his word. He speaks and things happen. He has that kind of power. He takes dry bones and gives them life, to put it another way in an Old Testament fashion there. And the raising of Lazarus also shows his deep attachment to those who have nothing to bring to the table. Those who are dead in sin. Those who are lost. He can create life out of nothing. This is what he does. Jesus had been informed by Mary and Martha that their good friend and brother Lazarus that they loved was very ill. He had heard this, gravely ill. And he responded with this statement saying, this is earlier in the text, or in our text just in the previous chapter, this illness does not lead to death. In fact, he says it is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Remember last week, the healing of the blind man? He said this is also for the glory of God, you know. You think this is a negative thing that has happened to him, but his very existence and what I'm going to do for him, that's for the glory of God. And soon thereafter, we know that Lazarus died, or as Jesus said, had fallen asleep. Now this confused them. And so that Jesus clarified that, yes, he did indeed die, but in me it's like falling asleep. But he did die, and that he was going to go journey and see him on a journey to go visit him and his death, basically attend his funeral. So in a surprise move, we'd find out that Thomas, uh, the one who would be known as Doubting Thomas, came to him and said, let us also go that we can, uh, we can die with him. Uh, he, along with Peter, Thomas and Peter, both have this great conviction at these early stages of Jesus' journey to the cross. Well, Jesus arrives four days later, after Lazarus has been placed in the tomb. Smack dab in the middle of funeral activities, wailing and weeping, whole process there. What you notice with Jesus throughout the New Testament is that he's really good at ruining sad and hopeless funerals keeps doing that. He's done it before. He seems to change things. Luke 7, Jesus saw the widow of Nain, whose son had died, and went over to her son's dead body and said, young man, I say to you, arise. And you know what happened? Lo, he got up and began to speak. Matthew 9, Jesus encounters a ruler's daughter. He said, go away. The girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him went and took the hand of the little girl and she arose. He just keeps ruining these funerals here. And his own funeral? They didn't even get a chance to prep the body. Didn't have time to see the funeral director. Jesus is really good at ruining sad and hopeless funerals. Thank God. So at this point in his ministry, Jesus had done many great miracles signs and miracles. He changed water into wine. He fed thousands with a few loaves and fishes. Healed the blind, made the lame walk, even raised a little girl from the dead. This was different though. This was a different one. He didn't just die, this Lazarus. Oh no, not at all. He was dead for four days in the tomb. 
This time, the Jesus, the doer of the miraculous, seemed to have met his match. And Jesus shows up, and he hears Mary start in on with this phrase, If only, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. If onlys are common at a funeral and events surrounding a funeral. If only I had spent more time with him, talked to him more. Maybe if I had encouraged him to live a healthier life. If, if only we could have done this or that together. If only, if only. If only I had been there when he died. The if onlys can be very debilitating. The if onlys, the regrets, are almost inevitable in a time like this. But with Jesus in the middle of all of this, everything changes. The if only still happen, they're just kind of inevitable. If only this would have happened, or I did this, or I took this more seriously, spent more time. But what Jesus does here is he tells her and us another phrase that's going to take more prominence than the if onlys. If onlys. And that phrase, and he's going to follow it with something else that's going to be just wondrous, is the phrase, I am. I am. He does this throughout the book of John. I alluded to that earlier. Even in this devastation, Martha hadn't lost hope. In response to Jesus saying he will rise again, she stated this, this wonderful confession that, yes, Lazarus will rise again on the resurrection at the last day. That was creedal. That was, she heard, must have heard the Nicene Creed or something. She knew that was the case. And what Jesus does for her there, and he does this for us too, is not just future promises, as real as that is. But he gives her a present reality, an I am reality. He does not deny her view of the future, but he wants her to know, and he wants us to know, that right now, he has something for her, and that really matters. Right now, he makes a difference. Right now, he will personify real and true hope. What does he say after the I am? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, uh, yet shall he live. He's not left her alone in her grieving. You're not alone in whatever you're dealing with. He has not left her hopeless. Not left her in her sins or us in our sins. He has not departed from Lazarus. He's in it all. It's as if he is saying, yes, you, Martha, will stop breathing. Lazarus will die. Indeed, after he is raised here, we know that he will die again. But when you live in me, death, that separation, that no hope, the dry bones, that's not permanent. It's not permanent. Even the grave will not contain you. Jesus then compassionately connects, the I am Jesus connects with those who breathe, who aggrieve. The Lord is compassionate. We know this from the Bible. Slow to anger, abounding in love. He's compassionate, especially at times like this. He meets Mary, who like her, her sister says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. To which it says that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit. This is a very powerful term that he uses here, deeply moved. It is closely associated with indignation or anger. So this isn't just an empathetic, empathetic thing. This is, this is I, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this kind of thing. I'm frustrated with this. 
angry about this? Well, what was he indignant or angry about? Not at Mary for a weeping, of course. But it seems that he is indignant with this whole mess of sin and death and everything that surrounds it. He is indignant that the world is not as it should be. He was indignant, deeply moved within him, that Mary would have to be in such pain that she falls at his feet. And this indignation quickly turns to weeping. We heard Michael say this earlier that here that Jesus cried. He wept. You know this very well. Grieving has a mixture of emotions. And they change from one moment to the next. But later he changed. He later one becomes into him. Just minutes later, one asks, if only. But now in verse 38, the same phrase is used. He is deeply moved or indignant again. But this time it causes him to say, this is what it causes him to say. Take away the stone. Jesus here compassionately connects to those who grieve. So we have hope like no other. We have the uh, if only to the I am's, his, his presence there. That's how he connects to those who grieve. And then there is that powerful voice that just changes things like nobody else's voice here, uh, the voice of Jesus. Take away the stone. To which he responds, it has been there four days. And this was especially significant back then because the Romans believed that after three days, the spirit would leave the body. In other words, there would be no question that he was really died or really dead. Martha reiterated that he had been dead for three days, essentially saying, Lord, we don't want an open casket here. Not now. Not in this climate. Jesus then prays. By the way, he's giving credit to his father. Father, I thank you that you have heard me, giving credit to his father. And with a loud voice says, with Lazarus, come out. And of course, if Jesus says something, it happens. Just what he does. And that same voice, my fellow baptized believers, has made you his own. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's his voice. You can take an unbeliever, make him a believer. That same voice through the power of the Spirit says, Take eat, this is my body and blood for you. And something happens. There's forgiveness, and there's life out of death, and there's strength that wasn't there before. All because of his voice. John 10 says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and nothing can snatch them from my hand. No one can snatch them from my Father's hand. His voice speaks also for the Father here. My grip on you is firm. This seems patently obvious, but needs to be said here. Lazarus couldn't raise himself. His sisters, even if they had figured out the if-onlys, couldn't have changed these circumstances. They couldn't raise him. We cannot raise ourselves from sin. We can't stop the reality of death and everything that surrounds it and leads up to it, which is so hard. We can't. But he can. And he has. And he will. The little boy in Sunday school thought a stampede of dead people coming out of the grave would be a bit much, just too overwhelming. But in fact, that is what will happen as believers planted like seeds in all those cemeteries will come out when Jesus comes again. Amazing. That's the powerful and compassionate Jesus on your side. The one who hears your if-onlys and responds with, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm your resurrection and the life. Compassion like no other. Indignant over death and sin like no other. 
a voice like no other. Yes, indeed. A Savior who loves to ruin hopelessly sad funerals. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, the offerings will be brought forward. The congregation may rise. In addition to our regular prayers, we will be praying for the family of Rich Dreher, who passed away this week. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus, and all people according to their needs. Lord, you raised your Son and sent your Spirit. Sustain us while we await Christ's attention to our present needs. Give strength to our prayers, heal our weaknesses, and restore all our losses. Give us faith throughout our days in Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, breathe your life into your church, that she may stand by your strength and will live it according to your word. Lay your hand on men of every era to proclaim your word and to bring life to the downtrodden, the faithless, the fearful, and the outcast. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all, you are the true source of life, which you give through the power of your spirit. Be with Life Network in Waterloo as they work to save your children in pregnancy. Protect, guide, and strengthen them to serve many. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord, the ones you love are ill and need your holy care. Rick, Susan, Agnes, Julie, Allison, Carl, Barb, Bob, Scott, Elaine, Peggy, and David. Make haste to help them. Spare their lives. Call them from their graves on the last day and unite them to you and all your saints. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Almighty, you are the great physician. Be with Wanda Portel and all the doctors and nurses providing care for her this week. Give them guidance to perform the best of their abilities. Be with Wanda, she recovers as to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. O oh, Father, we welcome your newborn child, Luke Benjamin Miller, grandson of Diane Miller, into life. Give his parents strength and wisdom on their journey of raising a child. Be with him as he may grow in all strength. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. God, be with the Columbia community as they mourn the passing of Richard Dreher. Give strength and peace to his family, especially. Let all people hear the good news of the gospel as they hope in the resurrection of the dead. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy Father, you have given the new birth of spirit and water in baptism. Make your children strong in your spirit, that they may shun the works of the flesh and live in this world, expecting the resurrection and the life of the world to come. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. We lift thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father everlasting God through Jesus Christ our Lord who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many 
that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, of all creation for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life at your command Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain and yet in mercy you provided a ram as a substitute we give you thanks that on Calvary you spared not only your only son but sent him to offer his life not not your only son but sent him to offer his life as a ransom for many as we eat and drink his body and blood, grant us, like Abraham our father, to trust in your promise now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. You may the body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who says, I am the resurrection and the life. May this strengthen you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in his peace and in his joy. <laughs> God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the Holy Supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Please be seated for the final hymn. 